There was a moment with How I Met Your Mother, or many moments where I was like, I can't believe I'm still playing the same role. I had a joke with someone. I was like, I've run out of faces to make it Barney. When I got on the show and I was having what looked to be, I mean, by our cultural standard, like a great success, I, I fell into this kind of despair, which drove me deeper into a spiritual search where I was like, what do I care? Like, what is meaning? My spiritual practice is how do I navigate losing anonymity, being on this big show, feeling trapped by this big show, also being alert to its many, many blessings? How do I not uh, wither under the opinion, praise, or criticism of other people? There was this very strange vertigo of being collapsed and over-identified with the character. It actually threw me into this kind of existential crisis, especially when How I Met Your Mother first came on for the first two seasons. I, I noticed by drinking, there was an uptick in it. To counteract the discomfort with the fame and the visibility, a bottle of wine and then smoking a lot of pot and then waking up and not remembering getting into bed kind of thing. My stuff with women was very kind of tied into alcohol. There were interactions that were piling up. I'm only now on some weird level like making some peace with that era because I found for whatever reason the, the show has continued to like blossom and grow. It's really an important thing for people and I'm like, oh my God, I was a part of that. I was like at the center of that. What a gift. You could be a proper atheist neuroscientist and know exactly what's happening to the brain when you're under the influence of any of these substances. But at some point, especially with ayahuasca, you will be so far from thinking about the pharmacology of it. You will be like, I'm being bathed by an angel. There's a being or a consciousness that is very benevolent, feels feminine, it's communicating with me, it seems to love me, it seems to know a lot about me, and it seems to be giving me some very good advice. I just had this transcendent, incredibly impactful, heart-opening experience. There's this feeling that you get like kind of homework, like, okay, I need to make an amends to that person, I need to stop drinking that. It took away the fear of my own extinction, like the idea of lights out. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Ian Bialik. And I'm not ready, but I am Jonathan Cohen. <laughs> and welcome to our breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. You're always surprising me. <laughs> no ready, set, go. Just right into it. Just, let's get into it. Um, I'm just going to say it. You know, usually we have like a, here's the clever thing we're going to learn in this episode. We're going to talk to Josh Radner from How I Met Your Mother about so many things. Fame, sex, ayahuasca, porn, death. The addictive nature of the society we live in and what to do about it. I did not know that Josh Radner had so many fascinating things to say about so many topics. He has this muse letter. He's a musician. He's also a writer and director. In addition to all the awesome things he's going to talk to us about regarding How I Met Your Mother, he's going to talk about the kind of, I mean, in his words, the despair that he found himself in with newfound fame how alcohol played a part in trying to make it better, how he discovered that fame and money do not bring happiness, but he has started tapping into what does bring happiness and contentment. And I learned so much from him. He's my favorite rabbi that isn't a rabbi. And if you're like, well, I don't want to really under, you know, hear more about fame and why the trappings of wealth are uninteresting, the conversation really expands into consciousness. We start actually with, are we living in a simulation? We also talk about what it means to feel held and in Josh's words, bathed by an angel and what getting in touch with a notion of benevolence, goodness, and kindness can bring to you no matter what you do in life. This is why you summarize so well. It's really a pleasure to welcome Josh Radner to The Breakdown. I'm pretty sure that We've had interactions before at like parties and such, but this is such a lovely, lovely opportunity to get to know Josh Radner better. Josh Radner, welcome to The Breakdown. Break it down. Thanks for having me. We're very excited to talk to you. Yeah? Well, because we're we're big fans of a lot of things you do. Um, I'm a very large fan of um, <laughs> your writing and the things that I've read that that you write are very interesting to me. But Jonathan pointed out that you basically... <laughs> 
you basically write about all the things we talk about on our podcast. Oh, is that right? He's okay. Like, <laughs> you're like, he's our ideal person because <laughs> we talk about science and spirituality. We talk about celebrity and the the dangers of yeah. the, of kind of a our consumptive society. Um, we talk about psychedelics. We talk about hey. death. Like we talk about all these Let's things. Let's talk about all of we, them. That's the thing. We were like, <laughs> we want you here to talk about all the things. Great. Um, Let's see, Jonathan. Where where should we start? Jonathan is like deep into like simulation theory, death. Oh, I, you know, much, I'm anti simulation like, <laughs> theory. I let's start there. I don't, I'm not <laughs> a proponent to say that we are in a simulation. And I was just reading the anti simulation theory. I think it's too simple. But at the same regard, while I don't believe in a techno simulation theory, yeah. I kind of believe that there is some form of intelligent life that has created this experience, that this is not the first time this experience has been created, that we are... Yeah, I could get behind that. So what you're saying is essentially that some sort of divine impulse or force is dreaming us. Would you say that? Or, or having an experience of us through us? Having an experience of us. I wouldn't say dreaming necessarily, yeah. but I would say that the fate of the collective human species, <laughs> whether this, you know, the earth survives and human species get, I don't know that there are levels, but like progresses beyond where we are now has a fate greater than just the eradication of the species or not. I think I know what you're saying. I just love that this is the first five minutes. Well, oh, oh no, we're not. <laughs> we're just getting warmed up here. Well, but also here, here's my question. Is that different from just regular God? Is it different from, you know, there's something greater than me that that has a bigger picture of what's happening and that there's no good or bad, there just is. And certain things I may perceive as like, this isn't how I want it to go, but like something greater than me has a better idea. Like, is is that different? Or you just get to say like, simulation theory, I sound so fancy. Well, what I always, my allergy to simulation theory is that from the tech perspective, like you were talking about, like, like 4,000 years in the future, there's some kid in a garage who's just like... Oh, I've seen Ready Player got, One. <laughs> got so much tech that we are his kind of playthings or like he's... Do, you know, I, I always uh, that always makes me like claustrophobic and panicked and nauseous, you know? But uh, but I think that if you... Because it's true. <laughs> I don't... I mean, if it is, it's really problematic, you know? N not for us though, because I mean, that's the thing. Like, how does it change what we're doing? Unless you're in the, you know, if you dip into other worlds where you are receiving other knowledge about truth and right. consequences, as it were. I just, I, I quoted in the thing I wrote, which you might be referencing, I don't know if you'd read that, but I, yeah, Terrence yeah. McKenna said this thing that we're trapped in a very elaborate work of art. Yeah. Which I really like, and maybe it's just my preferences. Like, I like thinking of things through the lens of like philosophy, theology, and art rather mm -hmm. than tech like i'm not a i mean i think a lot of the tech uh tech bros who who posit simulation theory is like tech is their god right so that's what they worship and that's how they conceive of the world right so but then I, everything that's not has my thing so then everything has to be constructed around that because right. that's sort of the letters that you're using to construct the words and the paragraphs and exactly the books exactly right yeah but whether it's art or whether it's tech the fact that people are stuck in something speaks to a larger consciousness, like people are trapped in whatever worldview awareness that they have and breaking out of that, whether it be that you need to look behind the veil of the matrix because it's a tech infrastructure, or whether it is that, you know, I have to look beyond my limited view of the narrative that I have in my head to see a larger view. It's kind of overlapping and speaking to the same thing, just using different language. I, I think that's right. But I also think that there's um there's a way <clears throat> to kind of approach this from more of a like healing benevolent space rather than a kind of, I don't know, there's something about the tech thing that feels so cold and um, I, I don't know, I can't locate the the warmth in it and it, it, it freaks well, it's me not, out. You know? It's not sort of designed to be that. Um, it also feels like it's, it's unhooked from ethics or values. There's no, I don't know what the value system is, you know? So, uh, I mean... If there's a more benevolent sort of um, overseer, where where is the warmth there? 
Well, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, I'm asking. I'm not uh, yeah, asking yeah, yeah. you to absolutely. So no, I'm no, saying for I, you, I think what, what does I get that tripped like? up when I think of God or benevolent overseer as a noun. Would you like it to be an adjective? No, I think it's a, a verb. verb. <laughs> okay. I think it's a verb. Do you know this um, poet Christian Wyman? Yes. Did you read? They just New Yorker did a profile yes. on him recently. Yeah. Yes. So I'm reading his book, My Bright Abyss, which I, I totally it. recommend. It's, I have read it. It's, it's incredible, it right? Is very incredible. Very incredible. But he talks about this getting tripped up on God as an object, right? And that in some ways the the kind of biblical commandment of like don't make any graven images, is like don't freeze me as a thing, right? Right. And I also think it's even broader, like don't worship something as me that's not me. I mean, look, historically, it was also to distinguish from tribes that did worship things that were right. inanimate that way. But yes, the sort of mystical understanding is you can't, if you try and touch it, it slips through your hands. Right. But also, I think we are always making gods of things that aren't God. Sure. Money, you know, sex, re sex relationships, work, food. Well, I mean, whatever is our addiction. I'm just listing mine. <laughs> whatever is our relationship. Uh, whatever is our addiction is our God. On right. Some and that's the wisdom of 12 step. It's like, why don't we get you unhooked from this false God right. and get you into something that's just more healing? God, 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 <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I get, I don't know. I, 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 look, this is the central conversation of my life. So I'm happy to, you know, be talking about it with you. <laughs> um, was this always the central conversation of your existence? Like, were you that kid? No, not quite. Uh, I went to an Orthodox Hebrew day school. So okay. I was like saturated in kind of like biblical stories and right. Talmud and was all that. Was your family Orthodox? No, or that was just the no, no, no. That, that was just the school that, that everyone kind of went to that wanted some sort of like Jewish education. Uh, then I went to a public high school. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know that I was, I just, I, it's hard for me to tease out whether I liked it, didn't like it. It was just what my childhood was. And then I discovered the theater and the theater was the thing that really lit me up, hmm. you know, just storytelling. And, but I think in some ways there was a, I can trace it back to, I did love the stories like in the the Bible. Mm -hmm. Like I really, those. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. <laughs> they're, they're weird. They're very yeah. weird. If you step back, they're very, they're trippy. very I mean, strange. Yeah. They're very psychedelic. Yeah. Um, well, the prophets. And know. then I think I, I think I, I had this worship of the, the like I would go into theaters and they were like a quiet theater it felt like a cathedral to me. Mm -hmm. Like it was, but I think once I got, uh, once I became a professional actor and started to have some success, I, I think I realized that it wasn't a big enough God for me. Mm. Like they're, they're started to, you know, it's kind of like when you, you get what you thought would make you happy and then you're in more despair than on the other side of it than you thought you, you know, than well, you were before. Well, if we can just sort of like take a little snapshot here, you were on a television show for nine years. Yeah. It's an enormous chunk, not only of your life, yeah. but it's very unusual. And we have a little bit of overlap. Yeah. It's very unusual in our profession to have any job that lasts I nine know, years. I know. So um, I'm kind of curious, like when it started, was the notion like, oh, we'll see how this goes. And then you kind of wake up and you're a decade older. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I mean, I, I remember the nine years, yeah. but, uh, but, <laughs> That's not what I but on some level, there is a like, this just happened. Like I, how long were you on Big Bang? Um, I was on for nine years. You were on for nine and years. And it was yeah. on for, you know, 12. Jeez. Um, and I, I mean, I was on a sitcom for five years from 14 to 19. And then, you know, I left and I had a, a normal life yeah. worshiping different gods of academia. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I was on for nine years. I mean, for me, I had two kids in that time. I got divorced. Like, you know, I like so yeah. many things happened. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was kind of like my second go at a sitcom life. So I was like, this could last a week and I'll be happy. Yeah. I don't know. Whereas like, you know, when I was a teenager, it's like, you can't really see past 14 when you're 14, right? Yeah. I mean, I think me dreaming about being in the theater or being an actor when I was 16, mm -hmm. I wildly exceeded my dream of what I thought. Like, I <laughs> I was just like, if I can do like some off-Broadway plays, a right. couple commercials, like I really had pretty modest, although that might not be true because Keep I've looked- Keep the bar low. You'll well, always impress yourself. <laughs> I've looked back at some of my writings and I was like, oh, I was actually more ambitious than I hmm. was letting on. So maybe Academy that's just Award. a story not I tell. It Award. wasn't quite that. But I, I wonder if I was like, I tell myself that like, oh, I was just a humble young <laughs> actor from Ohio, you know. Um, but I think- something that I do like about being an actor was this kind of like vagabond, like jump from role to role. 
I'm pretty mercurial and I like doing a lot of different things. So there was a moment with How I Met Your Mother or many moments where I was like, I can't believe I'm still playing the same <laughs> role. And like I had a joke with someone. I was like, I've run out of faces to make it Barney. Yeah. Like I don't have any more. I'm going to have to well, cycle I mean, back to the beginning of well, all my faces. I mean, sitcom is also, it's a specific art form. It's specific. You yeah. Know. Yeah. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Element. Element. Oof, it's a good one. It's a good one. They help anyone stay hydrated without sugar and other dodgy ingredients that are found in popular electrolyte and sports drinks. Electrolyte deficiency or imbalance can cause a ton of things that people don't realize. Headaches, cramps, fatigue, brain fog, weakness. Element is a zero sugar electrolyte drink mix born from the growing body of research revealing optimal health outcomes occur at sodium levels two to three times government recommendations. This is a time when you shouldn't listen to the government. Each stick pack delivers a meaningful dose of electrolytes free of sugar, artificial colors, or any other dodgy ingredients. Element is formulated for anyone on a mission to restore health through hydration, perfectly suited for athletes, folks who are fasting, those who follow keto, low-carb, whole food, paleo diets. I'm not necessarily any of those people. I'm just a normal person that needs to stay hydrated and appropriately in homeostasis with my electrolytes. Would it surprise you if I told you that I had done an enormous amount of research on the ingredients in other hydration packages? You love Element. From health experts, everyone from famed Stanford neuroscientists to functional nutritionists to moms, exercise enthusiasts, heavy sweaters, sauna sitters, and those who want a dynamite no-sugar margarita or mocktail incorporate Element into their daily routine. Element is championed by the chief health officers of the family, a family member who purchases most of the groceries and therefore influences a family's nutrition. Get your free Element sample pack with any purchase at drinkelement.com slash Mayim. Also try the new Element Sparkling, a bold 16-ounce can of sparkling electrolyte water. I like that one. Try Element totally risk-free. If you don't like it, they'll refund your order. No questions asked. Again, for your free Element sample pack, go to drinkelement.com slash mime. That's drinklmnt.com slash mime. Mime B. Alex Breakdown is supported by ZocDoc. Being an adult has its high points. Choosing your own bedtime. Choosing your own bedtime, eating ice cream anytime you want for dinner. I mean, you probably shouldn't, but it's an option. Or you can stay up past 9 p.m. on a school night to watch whatever you want on TV, but it's not all fun. Being an adult also means you have to do taxes and figure out what's for dinner every night and make doctor's appointments. But for that, there's ZocDoc, the healthcare app that makes adulting that much easier. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare high-quality in-network doctors, choose the right one for your needs, and click to instantly book an appointment. We're talking about in-network appointments with more than 100,000 healthcare providers across every specialty, from mental health to dental health, eye care to skin care, and so much more. You can filter doctors who take your insurance, those who are located nearby, those who are a good fit for any particular medical need you might have, those who are highly rated by verified patients. You can also see their actual appointment openings, which is so convenient. Choose a time that works for you and click to instantly book a visit. Plus, ZocDoc appointments happen fast, typically within 24 to 72 hours of booking. You can even score same-day appointments. That's my favorite thing, because sometimes my schedule opens up and I'm like, what do I do? You can get an appointment same day. As for me, I have a longtime doctor that I see, but ZocDoc is where I would go if I did not have that doctor in place. I've referred so many people in my life to their app and website. Stop putting off those doctor's appointments. Go to ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. Find and instantly book a top-rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. We're not supposed to compare our lives to others. You're not supposed to compare your life to mine? <laughs> it's easier said than done, though. Also, social media makes it look like everybody's life is amazing, and it's very hard not to be like, what am I doing wrong? Why doesn't it look like that? What, they have abs and... <laughs> vacations and they're on yachts. What's going on? Well, the fact is, and I talk about this in therapy a lot, therapy for me is a lot about sort of recentering my focus. And it's very easy to get caught up with what other people's lives look like and assuming that the outside that they show is specifically indicative of them living their best life while I don't feel like I'm doing that. Also, you might not even want to be on a yacht. You might get motion sickness. What is the right vacation for you? If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Fill out a brief questionnaire to batch with a licensed therapist. You can switch at any time for no additional charge. Stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. 
That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. I do know that when I got on the show and I was having what looked to be, I mean, by our cultural standard, like a great success, I, I fell into this kind of despair, which actually, to bring it back to what we were talking about earlier, it drove me deeper into a spiritual search where I was like, what do I care? Like, what is meaning? What what means anything, you know? Because the cultural script felt, I well, played it out. So, and it's, it's interesting because um, what I find so kind of compelling about the way you write about this is that, you know, a lot of people don't well articulate what you have articulated. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, I can sort of talk about it. I always feel self-conscious talking about it. I never feel like I've articulated it as well as you have mm -hmm. because I kind of feel like people are like, you're rich and famous. Right. You live in Los Angeles. Like, you can buy what you want, go where you want. Like, what do you have to be depressed about, right? And for me, I always feel like, you're right. It's just me. It's my chemistry. It's my genetics. Like, <laughs> right. I don't know. They haven't found the right pill, you know? But what I think is so interesting about the way you talk about it is you really are able to make this a more universal kind of conversation. Right. Because you had a very specific situation, right? Right. right. But we're all humans, right? Like yeah. Navigating whatever we worship, whatever we're told we should do, could do, whatever. But I, I think this is what what is so interesting to me is that I'm curious, like when, like, were you like going out to parties, like looking like a normal functional person? You know, when I was on, when I was on a show when I was a teenager, like I was a mopey teenager, but like, you know, right. you turn it on for the camera and then you kind of go home and you're quiet, but you were a grown adult, like functioning in a social structure. Like, did it feel like, oh, there, there's Josh having a day and he turns it on when he needs to, or did you kind of like make it through and this was an internal struggle you were having? My God, this question's making me melt. Sorry. Like, <laughs> like I no, I, I think it's a great question. Let me. I, you know I want, what I mean? I'm asking if, in yeah. retrospect, it's like, oh, it was hard, you know, <laughs> yeah. or if it was like, oh, there's something going on here, and I can't believe I'm still doing this. You know, you know I've struggled with the like, what do I have to complain about? But I, <laughs> like, we, if you live here long enough, and you're in the business long enough, you've met some really miserable Oscar winners, some really discontented, fabulously wealthy people. And I always tell people, like, if you really think money and fame and success are going to solve it for you, mm -hmm. the only thing you can do is go get them mm -hmm. to disprove it to yourself. And maybe, I don't know, maybe there are some people who are, it inoculates them against despair, but I haven't found that to be true with anyone. So I kind of want to... Uh, reserve the right to feel feelings still mm -hmm. as like a, hum a human, a yeah. human having a human experience. Um, Ram Dass, uh, who I'm sure you yeah. are familiar with, he said this thing He's that the table right he now. said this thing that whatever is your life, like whatever is your life, that's your yoga, that's mm -hmm. your practice. Yeah. So I just had to go. Okay, well, some people's life looks like this, and some people's life looks like this. I my yoga, my spiritual practice is how do I navigate losing anonymity being on this big show, feeling trapped by this big show, also being alert to its many, many blessings. Um, how do I still have a life outside that? How do I not make this? How do I not uh, wither on the, under the opinion, praise, or criticism of other people? Like, there were so many things to navigate that it wasn't just like an easy, like, I wasn't just uncorking the champagne. Like, it actually mm -hmm. threw me into this kind of existential crisis. Um, and I think there is, a, what you're describing, kind of like turning it on for the camera, there is this necessary kind of um, split in your consciousness where you're like, I might be having a tough day, but Ted's not having a tough day. So mm -hmm. I can't. But you also, as an actor, you just have to bring where you are that day. So I don't know. I think I, I look back and I think if, you, if you're on a show for a decade, they're going to see you in all your weather mm -hmm. and you're going to see them in all your, like you're, you're, you're going to see all the colors. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure that I was like a mopey pill some days. Mm -hmm. I just was. And other days I felt more lighthearted and had mm -hmm. more fun. Um, but when I look back on it now, it's kind of hard to synthesize, like to say that experience was this. It was so many things. It was my 30s, mm. you know, and and also what was happening off camera in my life in the off time um, was so transformative. And um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard for me... Um, 
I'm only now on some weird level like making some peace with that era mm -hmm. because I found for whatever reason the the show has continued to like blossom and grow and kind of it just it's it's really an important thing for people and I'm like oh my god I was a part of that I was like at the center of that what a what a gift and I and I've lessened the part of me that's like oh I wish people knew my the movies I directed as well as they knew mm -hmm. how I met your mother or whatever mm -hmm. and just kind of like let it be what it is which is pretty fantastic there's um a notion of sort of the um, you know the the role that you play when you play yourself as an actor yeah um was there a notion of like who am i <clears throat> yeah what happened was like when i went on twitter which is i mean a what a minefield place to go. that is yeah but i went on to promote I think it was liberal arts was coming out and I went on to promote that and I stayed like so many people do. Um, <laughs> or they wouldn't it's let like, me leave. It's like that shitty bar. Like yeah, you go in yeah. and you're like, I shouldn't be here, but, should, oh, but there's alcohol. So still, I'll stay. Right? Yeah. Um, I, there was just this weird thing where I would tweet the most innocuous thing you could imagine. Like, and people would be like, you sound like Ted. Are you trying to be like Ted? You know, and and I felt really bullied by it. I felt like, wait, what? I mm. I couldn't understand where this inability to distinguish like me as a person in the world who's contractually obligated to say lines, mm -hmm. and then this need for me to be this person. And they would, there was like almost this anger when I wasn't the person, or there was this um, weird ha 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 like. It was just, it was just weird. Like, um, I felt like because How I Met Your Mother covered so much terrain and so much life that when I was just living my life, people thought I was like nodding to the show or something. Mm. And I'm like, no, the show covered all aspects of like romance, relationship, friendship, aging, dying, living. Like, I need to do all those things. Like, I'm a human. Yeah. <laughs> like, I need to do all those things. Um, so there was this very strange vertigo of being collapsed and over-identified with the character mm -hmm. that I still, I feel it so much less. I mean, I don't really think about it unless someone kind of points and says something, mm -hmm. uh, which is only online. No one's rude in life, you know? <laughs> really? Uh, people are Try being a woman. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes people say obnoxious things. Uh, and, of but, course. Yeah. No, for, I mean, for me, not that you're asking, but I'll share. When, you know, when I was a teenager, it was very much like, why are you not smiling all the time? Yeah. Dance for me. Like Oof. literally, like literally That's dance horrible. for me. And this was also, I mean, look, there's more horrible things, like yeah. for sure. But when we talk about the things we're talking about, when we talk about sort of our development and especially when you're a teenager, which to me, like the 30s is just another version of teenager, right? Mm -hmm. Like every decade, I'm still like, feel like a kid and I'm, yeah. you know, learning and growing all these things. But, you know, this was before we had that consciousness. And, you know, I was I was raised by a very, a very tough lady. Um, and my dad was a very tough guy. And so I was taught to say, like, I don't have to smile for you, you know, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but when trying to socialize and, you know, I think it's, there's, there's different aspects, you know, for women and obviously for teenagers. But I think that's also why when I've, you know, read and been touched by what you write, like, it's true, even if you're a grown man, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think on some level, I, <clears throat> I've always had this mix of being, prodigiously wise and and thoughtful and um, having some equanimity about me and then being incredibly delayed and overly concerned with the opinion of others. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? Like it's that kind of, um, so so to be thrown, even though I was 29 or 30 when we did that, started that show, I, I don't know, I, I feel so much more formed and settled now, obviously. Mm -hmm. So So it wasn't like I, I know it's different than doing it as a teenager, but not vastly not, different. Right. You not, know what I mean? Not as different as as one might think. Yeah. When I think about what entertainment was like before the internet, before cell phones, I didn't know anything about any actor on a TV show that I watched. Right, right. Right? Like, I grew up watching every sitcom. Like, yeah. name a sitcom from the 80s. I grew up watching that. I, I didn't know anything. Like, you didn't know things about people. So we also got to experience a time in entertainment history yeah. where everything was available to people what we wore, who we were wearing, right? Like who we're dating, where we're going, what car we're driving, you know, all these things. So that that also is very different. And I think gives people a sense of ownership 
of the actor in a way that really previously hadn't existed that way. Yeah. It's so personal, you know? Yeah, and it's it's really unnerving. I mean, it's 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 like a weird thing where I want to do this incredibly public thing and I want to also have the right to my own complete it's privacy. It's like, look at me, look at me, but it's like, only look when at me. I tell you and when I tell you. Exactly. <laughs> and a lot of times I'm like, don't look at me. Like that's the, I always feel this war between the like writer-director in me and yeah. the actor in me. Like I really love being behind the monitor. I really love being in an editing room. I, I, I just, there's something about still being creative, but not like the camera right up in my mm -hmm. face. And there are certain days that I am, when I'm working, that I wake up and I'm like, the last thing in the world I want to do is be looked at mm. right now, you know? And then there are days where I'm like, I've made some more peace with it and I'm like, but um, I think I, I I don't know, I I know other actors who don't struggle with that as much as I do. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I say- And I'm envious just, of them. Yeah, uh, uh, also, yeah. I mean, I, I, I usually sort of divide actors into two categories. You know, there's people who really want that applause, like that drives them. And then there's people who just want to be told they did it right. <laughs> you know, and like for me, like it's not it's not about the fame, the things, the things you get like that, that's not what it's about. I want to know that you're happy. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. when you tell me you're happy and we move on, I did my job. Right. right. And that's a very different, you know, it's a di different neurosis. Right. right. It's right. a different look at me. Um, I wonder I wonder if we can kind of um, return to some of the simulation <laughs> theory ish. <laughs> no, no, I want to return to a little bit. Um, you know, kind of a side angle of what, what you were talking about in terms of fame. And I really, you know, it's it's kind of like um, for people who are actors or athletes or, or public people, you know, we're kind of getting a magnified experience um, of, um, you know, partly being on the receiving end of other people's worship, meaning mm -hmm. worship of fame or, you know, what, what their favorite show is or whatever. And, um, and I wonder... Um, you know, when you think about sort of other other things that we worship, what did you learn? You know, you kind of mentioned like if you think that fame and money are going to make you happy, but I'm kind of curious what else you learned about what what we worship, what we're seeking, and sort of where were the lessons for you in what you really would like to kind hmm. of serve? Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's it it remains a negotiation for me because I. I didn't get the thing where I was like, oh, I'm in the wrong business or I should, I should be doing something else. I actually, I feel like I've, I've isolated some gifts of mine that when I'm just dropped into the creation of them, the collaboration with people that I love and respect, um, I'm really lit up and I feel really complete and whole and like I'm, I'm walking the right path. But there's all these um, ditches like on the side of the road that I can trip into. Um, the opinion of other people is like been just one of the big demons of my life. Like what will people think? What's the, you know, 99 people love it. One person didn't. I'm obsessing about the one person. Yeah. Like th all of this I think is pretty like human nature stuff, but I'm, I'm really alert to like the shadow thing of like, love me, tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm mm -hmm. okay. Tell me I'm brilliant, whatever. And all of that stuff is a real distraction from the good work that I feel like I can do. And and some of it is just coming to peace with like not shaming myself for having those feelings. Like, are you an Enneagram person? Yeah. Do you know about the Enneagram? Yeah, what are you, by the way? Do you really have to ask? You're I'm a, a three. four. Oh, you're a four. Okay. Yeah. All the people who commit suicide. Those are my people. <laughs> the, the roomies and yes, the Patty the Smiths. Wolf, and the, right? yeah, yeah. Like really, really deeply. I'm a, I have I'm a, a relational four. So uh -huh. yeah, I'm like a very, yeah. So I'm a three with a four wing. Oh. But I feel like as I'm getting older, I feel your wing. my four is becoming much more pronounced. My three is because dimming a little bit. Because you're getting healthier or unhealthy? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to answer that. You'll have mm -hmm. to talk to my, okay. my team of therapists. <laughs> um, but uh, my three, once I learned about the Enneagram and the three is the achiever and they, they don't feel like they're loved for who they are, only for what they do. Right. I kind of like forgave myself a little bit because I used to think like, oh my God, I'm broken. I'm damaged. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, this is my factory model. Right. But it's your four that will tell you that that's true. That it's, that, that I'm, you're broken. That I'm broken and, and yeah. damaged. Yeah, sorry. Well, my four was the part of, my four was the part. Was that, that the part that liked to drink? Probably. The four. Yeah. yeah. And get all moody. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> my four also hated more than anything before I was, you know, more successful, like just pounding the pavement auditions, walking mm. into a room and seeing 14 guys who looked vaguely like me. Like, like that was the, that was death to my four that needed to be unique. But that's how you knew who came from the religious schools in Columbus. <laughs> well, it's also what made me want to be successful. Because I was like, I can't be in these, I can't be thought of, you know, mm. I just. You um, needed more special. I needed more special, I think. Yeah. Huh. All of which is like, it's a little embarrassing to talk about, but it's also like, that's what we're doing here, I guess. Yeah, just be embarrassing sure. ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Speak for yourself, um, But... But I, I don't know. I'm I'm fine. I'm about to, I'm going to be 50 this summer. And I, there's something about that approaching birthday. I didn't, I was 30 didn't rock me. 40 was fine. There's something about that one mm -hmm. that is really like looming for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, 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 it's transforming somewhat into excitement, but it really, I'm, I do find there's a lessening of like the, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Like, I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm finding some more kindness for myself, which is, uh, it's been a long time coming. Miami Alex Breakdown is supported by Pretty Litter. When my cats are healthy, they're happy. And that makes me happy. But I'm not a mind reader. I'm not a cat mind reader in particular. I don't always know if they're not well. Helping me keep tabs on my cat's health is just one reason that we are a Pretty Litter family. The coolest thing about Pretty Litter is it changes color. Like, they pee, but it'll change color to show any signs of potential illness. Like, you can... You can be flagged by the Pretty Litter for like UTIs in your cats or kidney issues. It's incredibly helpful. I've been using Pretty Litter for years now. I'd say maybe three years. It changed our life. It changed the smell in our house. My cats had no problem transitioning, which usually if you do anything to a cat that's different, they like freak out for three months about it. They had no problem transitioning. It's easier for my kids to take care of. It's, un it's an unbelievable change in our life. Pretty Litter's super light crystal base minimizes mess and dust, true. Plus, the crystals last up to a month, which for my children means less scooping, fewer trips to the garbage can, which means less tension in the house about emptying this litter. The health monitor is super helpful. It gives me peace of mind with their health, knowing that like I'll know if something's wrong. Instead of asking Jonathan or my children, are my cats okay? They were acting weird. Do you think something's wrong? The guesswork is gone. Pretty Litter ships free right to my door in a small, lightweight bag. They do come, they come in big bags, which are a little heavier, but I like the smaller ones. I never run out of it. And I don't have that huge, ugly container of litter, like taking up space and stinking everything up and having everyone say, why is this ugly box of litter here? Pretty Litter helps keep tabs on my cat's health and keeps odors down. You and your cat are going to love Pretty Litter as much as we do. Go to prettylitter.com slash break. Use code break to save 20% on your first order and get a free cat toy. That's prettylitter.com slash break, code break to save 20% and get a free cat toy. prettylitter.com slash break, code break. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by AG1. Fueling our bodies with whole foods is important, but every diet has its nutrition gaps, including ours. That's why we've started our days for the past three years with AG1. It ensures that we're supporting our whole body health and that our gut and immune health are running as smoothly as possible. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that delivers daily nutrients and gut health support backed by multiple research studies so you can trust what you're putting in your body. Why should your supplements be any different than anything else that you're putting into your body that you care about? We trust AG1 because unlike so many other products, the entire formula is backed by multiple research studies, not just the ingredients. AG1 is packed with a variety of nutrient-dense ingredients and is the perfect complement to my vegan diet. And it gives us peace of mind knowing we're covering our bases and it's trusted by experts and medical professionals. That's one less thing for you to research. If my gut isn't functioning optimally, I know it's more challenging to absorb nutrients no matter how healthy I try to eat. Digestion is one of the most important factors in helping your body receive high-quality nutrition. With AG1, we are prioritizing gut support. In a research study, AG1 doubled the amount of healthy bacteria in the gut, including two species known for specifically supporting gut and whole body health. These work together to break down food and are known to alleviate bloating, promote digestive regularity, and aid in digestive comfort. If there's one product we trust to support whole body health, it's AG1. That's why we've partnered with them for so long. It's easy and satisfying to start your journey with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash breakdown. That's drinkag1.com slash breakdown. Check it out. 
also, you're recently married. Yeah, five months. Wow. Yeah. Is this your first marriage? It is. Wow. It is. Were you, I mean, not to get personal, were you waiting? Like, did you think like, oh, I'm just not going to get married? Well. It's sweet. Looked at it (laughs) through the lens of attachment styles. Yes, which I'm also familiar with. Um, The character I played on TV was, I think, very much an anxious attacher. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm I was I'm very avoidant, mm-hmm. you know. So <laughs> that's like when people say like, you're just like that. I'm like, no, he was an anxious attacher. I'm avoidant. <laughs> like it's like I don't know if even people speak that language. But I found, you know, when people say like I had to I had to worry about not getting married on the first date. I was like I had to worry about not getting divorced on the first date because I would be like, this is why this isn't going to work. This is and I was really I was just constantly kind of building cases against people and just plotting my exit mm-hmm. out of everything. And I had some great relationships. They just, I just wasn't healthy enough. And I didn't kind of know who I was and what I needed and wanted. And then, um, turns out I needed like to be with a therapist therapist. who who (laughs) was from New York city. And I, you know, I dated so many people kind of in the the biz, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and in the arts. And I thought, no, those are the people that light me up. This is the, and that's where I meet people. And then I just, I met my wife they and your life force. it was, it was just suddenly like that thing where they say like, it doesn't have to be that hard. It mm. could be actually joy, enjoyable and fun. And, and, you know, we have our stuff like everyone, but I just am pretty psyched about it. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, avoidant attachment. You know, there's a lot about attachment theory now. It's like people are putting it in their dating profiles. And I've, I've read, you know, some pretty interesting kind of you know, articles a little bit critical of using that nomenclature yeah. in place of other words, meaning like maybe you're not a, a anxious attached. Like maybe you're not anxiously attached. Maybe he's really ignoring you, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. And you should yeah. get out. For you, you know, sometimes when we talk about these attachment styles, you know, some people really want to attach, but it feels so scary that they will pull away, and then yeah. other people really kind of want to do without, even though they know that, you know, socially that's not favorable. Right. Um, what did it sort of, what, what did it look like for you? Well, I think I agree that some of this stuff can be incredibly reductive and that there's a bigger sure. kind of keyboard to play and all this stuff. <clears throat> I do think that underneath the deepest part of an avoidant <clears throat> is an anxious attacher. Like mm-hmm. underneath it is like, that very human need to connect and love and be loved. Mm -hmm. But there's a wound. There's just like, okay, I learned that if I'm going to, say, show these authentic or messy or ugly parts of myself, I I will be rejected and therefore I'm going to get out Mm. before anyone sees these. And it's not conscious. It's not conscious. That's the thing. You're just like, no, this feels bad. This feels like I got to run away. I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like I'm <laughs> I'm in prison or whatever the thing was. Just took a turn, but okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, just w- when we feel... Like suffocating? Th- like, yeah, like oh. when you feel threatened or mm. or like, like with intimacy, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, I got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. And I just did a lot of work around that stuff. Like I did a lot of work around like, I had to, I had to really go into the hard drive and be like, where did I get this? Like, mm-hmm. why am I, why is this so hard for me? I always felt like, like there's a day in school where they teach you how to have healthy, long lasting relationships. And I was like, I think I was sick that day. Like I didn't get that. And I was so good at other things and I couldn't figure this thing out. Mm. And I just, you know, it took me like really a decade of like doing some very deep work. And um, I just met my wife at a time where I was um, just a little healthier, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's very, I mean, it's very, um, it's, you know, it's heartwarming. It's, it's hopeful, you know, I think, cause a lot of people feel like if they didn't have the right template, right. Or, um, if they didn't figure it out that they're not going to, um, you know, so many things about the way you speak about a lot of these kind of pitfalls, like relationships and, and fame and attention, you know, they are things that, that you do hear a lot when people talk about the draw to numb out, right. Right. Like, and you've talked a bit about alcohol and, um, you've talked about, you know, some of this incredible journey, which we, you know, we want to um, talk to you, you know, specifically more about. But um, I wonder if you can sort of articulate, you know, were there times that other things seemed like a solution, you know, a temporary solution for a permanent problem, as it were? <laughs> you know, wh- was that alcohol? Was it work? You know, was it like, what did that feel like? And how do you release that? 
I mean, I think that <clears throat> we're always kind of running science experiments on ourselves. We're like, okay, if I eat pizza five nights in a row, this is how I feel. Okay, <laughs> let's jot that down. Like this is, you know, and if you're paying attention, you'll actually see cause and effect everywhere. You're like, if I, you know, don't get good sleep or I eat, you know, or if I drink and okay, now hangovers, I'm having weirder hangovers than I did 10 years ago. Uh, for me, it's just kind of, I have twin impulses. I have like a pleasure seeking hedonist that is okay with some kind of self-destruction. And then ever so slightly stronger is this feeling of like wanting to be really healthy and alert and have some longevity to things. Um, and that part is, is more pronounced now that I'm older. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's hard. I mean, I think that, yeah, I was, um, my, my ambition to, um, like I said, I, some of my ambition I think has been, is, was appropriate and right. And other, others of it is, um, to, to, to counteract the discomfort with mm -hmm. like the fame and the visibility. I was, you know, especially when How I Met Your Mother first came on for the first two seasons, I, I noticed my drinking had gotten really, um, it just, there was an uptick in it, mm -hmm. you know? And is that like when you go home, like, like, yeah, I would notice like the glass like, of wine just started earlier and earlier. What did it look like? It looked like a bot, like a bottle of wine, and then smoking a lot of pot, and then waking up and not remembering getting into bed, kind of thing. Like that's what it. it that started to happen. Yeah. quite a bit. Um, that's numbing. Yeah, and I also think my stuff with women was very kind of tied into alcohol, mm. but very much like. Um, there was an addictive quality to that, you know, relationships or, you know, I use relationships like loosely around that. You know what I mean? It was just, like, yeah, there were interactions that were piling up. And I, I just, you start seeing like, okay, this isn't the best version of me. Hmm. You know, there's, I always felt like there was this kind of better version. And I, I've let go of that a little bit and just been like, okay, I'm all of these things. I'm all of this. But, um, I, I, I've written and talked about this, but I ended up going to Brazil. I started working with ayahuasca, which I did a lot over uh, around about a decade. I haven't done it for quite a bit, but I it was really important to me, and it was really was it, give me a time frame. Is this so? This summer after the second season okay, in two thousand seven, I went to Brazil. I did six ceremonies down there, and then I went to Colombia and did three more that same summer. So I came back uh, in Colombia. I had this evening that was like all about my drinking. Mm. And I have um, some alcoholism in my family, not, mm -hmm. not active act addiction in my mm -hmm. house I grew up in, but grandparents and stuff like that. So I kind of like, I really saw that it was like, it's in me and it had mm. my, it's hooks in me. I could see how much it had mm. its hooks in me. So I didn't drink for about four years. And then over the years, I would go like two years of not drinking, one year of drinking, three years of not drinking, mm. six months of drinking. And it's been about seven years since I've had mm. a drink. And my life is just infinitely better without alcohol. It's like, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to consciousness alteration. I enjoy mm -hmm. the occasional whatever. Mm -hmm. But I just have, I kind of have this truce with alcohol. Like you stay over there, I'll stay over here. And I don't mess with it. It's, um, you know, we've talked about it here. You know, it's like a literal toxin, you yeah. know. Um, and I, Jonathan, do you want to tell about my... Mayim doesn't drink anymore. I mean, a couple sips and uh, and your your flush. It has some pretty intense. Uh, started to have some. No, pretty, I started making my hands yeah. itch. Oh, oh, that like happens I, to my wife. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I think I. I mean, I think I'm wired for that. I'm definitely. I've got that gene. And you turn red too. Well, I don't. It wasn't so much the turning red. Like everything started itching. Oh, okay. And I was like, this feels really like a no. Yeah. You know, like if the body keeps the score. Yeah, as I heard, the it body does. was the body was really yeah, and I. It wasn't even that I was. I mean, there have been times, you know, that I've drank more than uh, one ought. Um, but you know, I what I what I know to be true about alcohol is that. I'm nicer after I've had a glass and a half of wine. Mm. I'm nicer. Mm -hmm. You like me better. Mm -hmm. I promise, you know? And I listen to a lot of AA speakers and, you know, that's a very, very common thing that that addicts will say is like, I, I, I don't know what it is about being sober that makes me <laughs> so ornery yeah. and complicated, but 
for me, I no longer wanted that solution. Right. You know, I no longer so wanted... So you don't drink anymore? I don't drink anymore. I mean, I have like a sip of Manischewitz on Friday night yeah, yeah, if we yeah. make a kiddish. But no, I don't. I stopped over over COVID and also like my sleep really shifted. Yeah. Um. But, you know, there was a lot. I mean, Jonathan has witnessed, you know, there was a lot of... um you know, especially as a scientist, me not reading the data, <laughs> right? you know, that right. my body was kind of, you know, putting out. So, um, yeah, I think I would have really liked to go to Brazil and Colombia and have had, you know, like the kind of experiences you're talking about. You don't about. need to do that. I know, but like <laughs> mine get... wasn't as fun. Mine yeah. was like, Wah, I'm yeah. not going to drink anymore. I'm itchy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it sounds like you were a little bit ahead of the curve on the ayahuasca game. You know, mazel tov to you. Yeah, I thanks. like to say you can't, you know, swing a dead cat in Los Angeles without, you know, know. either hitting an ayahuasca and I, and ceremony. And I, or... I, I was incredibly, um, you know, I had the zeal of the newly converted. I mean, sure. I would, I, it, it got to such a point where I was at this very fancy place and I saw a, a well-known person who I won't say but she looked at me and she did like, she beckoned me with her mm -hmm. finger. And I just walked up to her. I had to look behind me to make sure. And I got up and she said, so I understand you're the person I talked to about ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. you know." And I was like, oh, okay. This is like, right. because I was talking to everyone about it. I was such a freak. You were that guy. I mean, it was just like, it was so astonishing to me that it existed. And, and I was, I mean, a lot of people didn't know about it. And, and I was just... And I wrote a lot about it and ended up not publishing a book that I had sold. And I, I'm now, um, I now don't think it's for everyone. And I'm, I'm a little more modest. <laughs> did you think my, it, did you think it? Oh yeah. I mean, I had the, like, all politicians have to get in a room and drink oh, this yeah. stuff. I know Be that Because feeling. it's such a feeling of like oneness and unity and like the last thing you want to do is wage war yeah. or hurt oh, anyone. Be, yeah, or, I mean, uh, I really had this realization of like, oh, this is why they made pot illegal because people who smoke this won't go to war. <laughs> and that's a Bill Hicks joke. I like mean, he yeah, actually exactly. has the that's, whole thing that about sense. that. Correct. Like, yeah. I mean, look, and in a, you know, in a, in a more intense sense, you know, when Timothy Leary, you know, sort of came on the scene and was sort of articulating some of this, it was like, there's a reason, you know, and we had, um, we had Rick Doblin on and, you know, so like we've oh, talked cool. about, you yeah. know, sort of those, it was one of our earlier guests. Well, Josh, can you take us to the first time, you know, it was obviously many years ago, it wasn't as popular, what was going on in your life and like paint the scene that you're like, this is something mm -hmm. I'm going to go explore. And yeah. I mean, there was the <clears throat> the uptick in drinking. There was, you know, How I Met Your Mother was a strange arc because it was like the first couple seasons we were just on somewhat quietly. It had like a really rabid fan base. It had a young audience for CBS, which they really wanted. And that's what kept us on the air. And then like the fourth season, it went on Netflix. And that's when it kind of became a hit. It just like, it tipped and exploded. And we all felt the kind of difference out in the world. Um, but those first two seasons, I was you know, just navigating so much. I, I also think there's something about when you're unformed, this is what I, it's kind of what my movie Liberal Arts is about. One of the themes is like, when you're in college or just out of college, it's like everything's in front of you. And then these things happen, life happens and things get crystallized. And, and suddenly you're like, oh, this is my story. I'm not going to have another story. Like these nine years will be these nine years. And It'll be in my obituary. And like, there, there's just, a, there was a sadness with the almost like crystallization of the fact of things, if that makes sense. Um, so I just, I was in some kind of low grade despair. Um, a friend mentioned it. I'd never heard of it. And I picked up this book by Daniel Pinchbeck called Breaking Open the Head, where he like was also in despair and, and, remembered these psychedelic experiences he had in college that were really powerful. So he went on like a worldwide tour of like shamanism and substances and, you know, um, entheogens and he just tried everything. And I, and I read it and then through another friend, just randomly, they were like, this guy, Ralph Miller's coming into town. He's talking about these trips he does to, uh, Brazil people. Uh, my friend David went and had the, the best time. So I went and heard this guy who's still like one of my dearest friends in the world. I just was with him last night. And uh, within five minutes, I was like, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to mm -hmm. go down to Brazil. 
I'm going to spend two and a half, three weeks down there. Can we just, I just, yeah. wanna, like, sometimes people go to therapy. Yeah. Well, sometimes all of which I had done. To, oh, okay. So this is what I was going to say. It wasn't like step a step groups. Like, yeah. Like, not all of us are like, I'm feeling despair. Let's go to Brazil. Yeah. I don't know. It was some sort of like, oh, yeah, this is going to happen. Huh. And then I went down there and. Wait, hold on. What did therapy say to you? Uh, I don't know if was I in, no I wasn't therapy at that time like because sometimes people try an antidepressant like that was de rigueur yeah, you know yeah I don't know it felt more like a like a shtetl melancholy instead mm -hmm. of like a clinical depression <laughs> it was a shtetl collie you know it was like I just felt like Jacobian and sad mm -hmm. you know I don't it didn't feel like I needed although I you know I went on an antidepressant for like three days in my late 20s and it was a disaster <laughs> I had like a manic fit. I, look, I don't care if you're on medication no, or not, not, but usually, but oh, it was not a match. It was not a match. <laughs> Got it. I was like, I was grinding my teeth. Like it felt like I had taken some MDA. Like it was really like a very intense experience. And they were like, you got to go off this. Um, and then I found the power of now by Eckhart Tolle and then my um, depression lifted. Okay. So um, what happened? I, I went down there. I don't know. I just, I, I felt really called and I... I did it, and I I felt like something just shifted. Is it in, me. in a group? Yeah, on the Were beach. Were you recognized? Mm, I can't remember. No, not well. No, not really. Okay. Yeah. Did you have to prepare? I mean, you do like a very kind of you diet. Yeah, people stuff. may want to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then was there integration after? Yeah, lots. So what is that like? Sitting around and talking about it. Got it. And, yeah. Um, meditating, walking on the beach, and. Mm -hmm. It was just really peaceful. I came back and I felt, I don't know, I felt kind of newly born. And then I started drinking again and the mm -hmm. thing went down. And then I went to Colombia and I had the, the, the one about my drinking. So no, you don't have to like go into specifics, obviously, if, if you don't want to. But like, was there a profoundness to that first experience that you were like, oh, this is a gateway that I'm going to feel really called to do? What did, did the continuation? Because there aren't that many people, I guess, who have done it as consistently over the number of years. So I'm curious has it, how, how it shifted and, and trying to get to that question by sort of understanding, you know, how it started. Well, I don't know if I needed as much as I did. At some point, I think I do have a psychological addiction or dependency on this thing. And that's why I took a lot of time off. Also, I was in a community that kind of crumbled and and it was really hard for me just emotionally. But uh, early, the early, I, what I would have said was, you know, if someone said, oh, I've been looking for a spiritual community and I found this church and the choir is unbelievable and the pastor just said these words that lit me up and I couldn't believe how at home I felt. <clears throat> and someone said, oh, that's amazing. And they said, I'm going to go back next week. Mm. And they say, well, why do you need to go? You went. So I think like spirit is something that needs to be like tended to like on some regular basis. There's all these studies like if people have a spiritual community, they even live longer. Yeah, we we did a talk at South by um, about the intersection of science and spirituality and specifically talking about like what actually is happening in the brain when you pray, when others pray for yeah. you, when you have gratitude, when you yeah. have mindfulness. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's I, I really buy it. I really do. Yeah. And so for me, it was just like, well, I just had this transcendent, um, incredibly impactful, heart-opening experience. I would like to have that again, mm. you know? Mm. Um, and, I, and I went back until at some point I felt, you know, there's this feeling that you get like kind of homework, like, okay, I need to make an amends to that person. Mm. I need to stop uh, drinking that whatever, putting that in my coffee or like whatever it is, you know? Um, or a, a, an, a, an idea for a project. And then at some point it was like the homework kept being the same. And I was like, I think I just need to go live outside this space. Mm. Um, but I'm not opposed to revisiting it. What was the homework? I mean, it, it depended. Uh, like a lot of it was, I think it was just about living more consciously and being less reactive and, you know, just, just being awake more, if that makes sense. And then there were other specific things like you do owe this person an apology. I found one of the most astonishing things about ayahuasca was when you're locked in like a, a real grievance with someone, it would grant me the ability to see it entirely from their perspective. And I was suddenly like, oh, 
that's what their their experience mm. of this was. I can now offer a full apology mm. because I see where they where they were tripped. It's much up. more fun than a fourth step. Yeah, but I've done those too. <laughs> so uh, they're both effective. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to ask like a real downer question. Great. When we talk about um, these ceremonies, right? Mm. We talk about um, ayahuasca, and you know, also you can extend it out to. Um, to psilocybin, mm -hmm. you can extend it out, you know, even to ketamine, meaning when not used as a party drug, um, you know, when used in um, a therapeutic, you know, environment. So what, what's happening, what we know is happening is like, these are really powerful chemicals. And in, in, in particular, you know, ayahuasca, is, it's a very sacred medicine, yeah. you know, it's a very sacred medicine. And it's been used for, I believe, thousands of years, Probably, right? Probably, yeah, it's, they're this not is sure, a, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what we know happens is that a ton of, you know, fascinating things happen in the brain and in the nervous system, right? Um, so, you know, there's this kind of cascade that happens and all these chemicals are released. And, you know, um, you know, one of the things people often report, you know, with, with mushrooms, like everything seems so clear. And it's like, yeah, because like there's actually sensory things that we know are, mm -hmm. you know, kind of being filtered differently and it's affecting, you know, this, it's affecting that. So I wonder just, you know, when we think about it, you know, every time you have this experience, you're having this kind of, you know, chemical excitement, right? Mm -hmm. And it does, it brings all this clarity and it allows you to see all these things. And it could also be incredibly dark and challenging. Uh, right, yeah. right. Well, but, but also, but, but ultimately, and the idea is that in the right environment, you know, there's something also on the other side of that mm -hmm. darkness and, uh, and, and that challenge. So I guess I'm just sort of curious, like, you know, what, what your sort of take is on it. Like, you know, of course, it feels good to have those experiences, but I guess the hardest thing is like, what do you bring down from the mountain? You know? Right, right, right. Yeah, so yeah. I, I guess that's sort of what I'd be curious about because I'm sure that shifts, but as a sort of experiential, you know, thing, yeah. Um, what, what did it feel like you were living kind of in between journeys? That's a great question. I'm going to have to kind of like amble my way <laughs> to yeah, an answer. No, it's just... I, I, one of the things, you know, when people talk about the like pharma ecology of it. Mm -hmm. I always feel like you could be a neuroscientist. You could be like a proper like atheist neuroscientist and and know exactly what's happening to the brain sure. when you're under the influence of that. Any of these substances. But at some point, especially with ayahuasca, you will be so far from thinking about the pharmacology sure. of it. You will be like, I'm being bathed by an angel. It feels great. <laughs> I feel at home. And at one with the universe, That's whatever. Just a weekend for me and Jonathan. <laughs> whatever it is, and you, you will. There, it's hard to hold on to this idea of like, okay, this is these are just molecules in my brain. Mm -hmm. There's something like there's a being or a consciousness that is very benevolent. It feels feminine. It's communicating with me. It seems to love me. It seems <laughs> to know a lot about me, and it seems to be giving me some very good advice. So you're talking about the spiritual, right? This kind of to me, it's like I experience. don't, I don't know. Maybe it's the same thing as my allergy to like simulation theory from a tech perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't. I I'm fascinated by science. I like reading about it, but I, it's not the first way I like to conceive of the world. Mm -hmm. Like, I I like to think of things much more. I'm more of a mystic mm -hmm. about things. I'm much more about like this is all, you know, the kind of Vedic Kabbalistic. Like, this is just. Mm -hmm. Like just God just made itself into everything. Mm -hmm. um, Did you feel that before these experiences? I think so. I think I had I had experience. I mean, I'd done some psychedelic. I I didn't get into psychedelics until my thirties, which I actually recommend to people. Mm -hmm. I think your brain is too unformed. I had friends that were doing psychedelics in high school, yep. and I just don't. I don't think the pineal gland can handle right. it at that age. You know, <laughs> so. Um, what did I take down off the mountain? I mean, I think that I, I, the thing I took the most was that if this is nature, like if this is actually like, let's call it mother nature or the, the earth's wisdom mm -hmm. and you can ingest it mm -hmm. and it can communicate with you through this weird spiritual ecological mm -hmm. technology. It, I felt that at the heart of the heart of the heart of the heart of the thing was a benevolence mm. that it was not cold, indifferent, uncaring, um, you're on your own kid, survival mm. of the fit. Like, it didn't feel like any of that mm. kind of cold stuff. It felt like there was this heartbeat of benevolence that I was a part of that cared about me and wanted me to care about others. Here's, here's a hard question. Is that true? 
I think it's as true as we believe it's true. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, you know, I think the way certain people, I think that it, this is so relativistic and I, and I, and I believe in, uh, I, I don't believe that everyone can create their own moral system. I don't mm -hmm. necessarily believe that, but I do believe in relativism in as much as how we believe the world should operate or how we operate in the world, the world generally kind of get, gives us back what we're mm. kind of envisioning. Like if we're... Well, yes, and I cannot imagine having that experience and then returning to being a full-time actor on an incredibly successful sitcom. It was incredibly disorienting. What the hell was that like? Yeah. Wait, I just want to clarify something. I don't know... I don't think that people who are living in under terrible conditions, under terrible duress, under terrible regimes. Like, I don't think that's a problem with their thoughts. Like, I think there are geopolitical things that are happening that are we are often at the mercy of. Mm. But I do know for me personally, it's like my friend Dion says this great thing. He says, I don't know if there's a God. I just know that when I act like there is, my life is better. You know? And I don't know how to run that through an actual scientific experiment other than go, I'm the scientific experiment, and I know that when I am forgiving, I get forgiven. When I'm mm -hmm. kind, it's the prayer of St. Francis. Like, mm -hmm. I just kind of, I get back what I put out generally. And sometimes life is mystifying and unjust and unfair, and I don't know how to square any of that. But I do know that I felt, I felt very much like there's something good beating at the heart of this. It's, it's not a punitive, you know, fire and brimstone thing. That's that's what I felt. Um, and as far as going into, yeah, it was so strange to be like having these burning bush type experiences and then like having to be in a strip club with Barney, you know, <laughs> like one episode a month later. It was strange. And I, and it, it created some cognitive dissonance in me. Yeah. But I also tried to bring some of what I was learning and how I was changing and growing. I tried to bring it to the set. I tried to, you know, bring it there. Was it received? Did you talk to anyone, your castmates, people on the set about what you were going through? Um, I tried. I felt like some people were curious up to a point and then it was kind of like, It okay. was not really talked about this kind of thing yeah. back then. There were like, you know, the first AC, Dave really wanted to talk about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there were, <laughs> certain writers wanted to talk about it. Like it, it was... It, you could kind of see who who was sparked to well, it. Well, I think that's still, you know, kind of to some extent, um, you know, I, I don't think it's only true of, of people who have had, you know, psychedelic experiences. But, you know, one of sort of my interests in like, you know, intellectual religious thought is that, you know, the, um, the mystical teachings of many traditions were touching the same thing, right? Yeah. And so, you know, my sort of understanding, and I'd like to hear more of your take on it, is that, um, you know, the the notion of of benevolence, mm -hmm. uh, the notion of what you're describing is a feeling of comfort, right? And I, I do, you know, I can't help but think as a scientist, right? What is that? Like, there's something going on when you feel comfort like that, right? It's a, it's a sensory and kind of emotional, you know, concoction that's happening. Um, but this notion you know, of um, spiritual protection, right? Um, the thing that we're saying makes you not want to kill other people, right? Mm -hmm. Makes you not want to go to war, makes you want to forgive, mm -hmm. makes you able to literally see the other side of something, right? To see someone else's pain so that right. it's not just, you know, what they did to you, but what you did to them. Um, you know, there's this sort of underlying notion of unity, right? Uh, like the whole planet, the whole universe. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about what that spiritual experience kind of felt like and where that then sort of lived in you. I would read scripts through the lens of like, does this contribute to this kind of um, world that I touched mm. there in, you know, South America or wherever I was? Or does it feel like it's actually um, creating more toxicity in the world. Like I, I got really, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I, I'm not opposed to playing villains. I'm not opposed to, I think villains are actually mm -hmm. incredibly important in stories. I just, there are certain stories that really felt like this is, um, not going to help anyone to, mm -hmm. to be, and I didn't want to be a part of those. The stories I wanted to tell 
I always uh, thought of it, you know, leave your characters better than you found them. Like I always wanted to tell stories about resilience and about, um, yeah, benevolence. Like the things that make me cry in movies are when someone's being kind. Mm. Like that's what gets me. You know, it's not like when someone, you know, gets sick or so, although that's tragic too. But I, I, I think also once I became a musician, mm. the songs I was telling were, were that I wanted to sing were like heart opening songs. And I don't mean this in any sort of like glib, facile greeting card way. I'm, I'm trying to get to the deepest hmm. perennial kind of thing. I have to believe that's because of what you experienced. I mean, but I, it's chicken or egg because like, did I, did I uh, respond so ferociously to ayahuasca because of who I was to begin with, mm. or did it fundamentally change me? Mm. I mean, I don't remember being that much of a nihilist before. So maybe this was just, and I've done other, med like I've done ketamine and I am like, that is not my medicine. Like mm. whatever that thing does, it's mm -hmm. like, it doesn't do the thing to me that other people mm. claim it does. So I think we just have what to, does it do? what does it do? Like, yeah. To no, me, what does it do? Yeah. It makes me feel nauseous. Oh. <laughs> And I don't want to make art about that. Got it. You know. <laughs> it's a different kind of art. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, I wonder, you know, you've talked a bit about death, and apparently your wife is a specialist <laughs> in yeah. helping people with these concepts. How does that fit into this kind of spiritual understanding? Like, did you, did you come to terms with something in these experiences specifically about death? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like it took away the fear of my own like extinction, hmm. like the idea of like lights out. Like I, I've never quite believed that it was just lights out, hmm. but it, <clears throat> it didn't take away my fear of suffering and pain, sure. which well, I still maybe, have, Yeah, right. <laughs> but it did take away my idea, this idea that my death, uh, my not being here would be the most calamitous thing to befall humanity. <laughs> like it just kind of was like, Oh no, no, no. We are, we're here. We die. We spring up. We return. Like, wait, wait, wait. hold on. What? Well, I mean, Maybe you want to talk us through that a little bit. What do you mean? Like, you, we were here, we, we spring up. We, we spring up and have a life. Like, yeah, then. And then we, I don't know, return to the earth or okay. return to the cosmos or return right. to the big soup or take on another body. It's not like bye-byes. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, do we I come back? So. I suspect we have some sort of, but we Does don't. Does that make uh, you feel good? Yeah, <laughs> mostly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Have you... I, I mean, you've read about NDEs and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we've had some. We've actually had some pretty, pretty um, uh, astonishing episodes talking to some NDE people. So, so yeah. and correct me on the science if this is I mean, wrong. One in particular, Elizabeth Crone, but yeah. At birth, there's this kind of rush of DMT, mm -hmm. and at death, there's also this rush of DMT, mm -hmm. and that's the active ingredient in ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. So. I think it does mimic a kind of like birth and death process, but what it also shows you, I think is that there's like a, a, a biological mercy to birth and there's a biological mercy to death in terms of there's a, a, a it smooths the passage in mm. and it smooths the passage out. I read this book about Montaigne, the essayist, mm -hmm. years ago. And um, when he was in his mid-30s, he was a really wealthy guy and he was on his estate and he got thrown off a horse and he started having a seizure. And he was like foaming at the mouth. He was bleeding out his nose. And they were rushing him back to the... Um, uh, his mansion. And uh, he was fully alert. He remembered it all. But everyone was panicking around him. Mm -hmm. And he ended up living uh, much longer. But his memory of it was that he was at death's door. He oh, felt yeah. that he was at death's door. But he also felt this wash, uh, 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 something washed over him that was like he was safe, he was fine, he was going to be taken care of. Mm. And, he, and ever since, uh, the, from that moment on, he never feared death because he said, nature takes care of you mm. when you die. And so, uh, you know, having tasted the vine that brings you up close to that, it, it, it made me less scared of the actual fact of death and even the process of dying. I, now, talk to me when I'm on my deathbed. I might be railing, a, well, you know, but... No, but that that definitely it frames how you approach things, right? Yeah, and I, I I think we're still much of humanity is motivated by this kind of denial and and um, aversion to death. Like I think that in our culture, like we hide our old people, we hide them on screens. We don't, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're all trying to hide our own evidence of aging. And we're I don't know anyone who's really immune to some of that to, uh, to some degree. 
but it does feel like um, it's so silly. The option, the other option is dying young, which doesn't seem like a great thing. So I don't know. Making peace with all of it feels like mm-hmm. sensible, right? Um, it, it's, I don't know. This is sort of where it's um, kind of taking me. You know, you've, you've talked, you, you, you've done some really interesting writing um, around porn, mm. you know, and around kind of like our sexual, um, you know, our, our, our kind of sexual natures being manipulated for lack of a better word, you know? Um, and, you know, it's, it's yet another one of these things that we both, you know, kind of worship. Um, and also that can very easily slip into like, you know, kind of an addictive, yeah. you know, an addictive sort of pattern. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what has compelled you to speak about this? It's mm-hmm. something that like, you know, there's very specific conversations that we're comfortable having about porn. Like we're comfortable talking about you Hefner, right? And we're comfortable talking about like sex trafficking is bad. And, you know, but there's, there's, there's not a lot of comfort we have in sort of talking about this thing that most people don't want to think about it being problematic, mm-hmm. right? People want their porn <clears throat> yeah. and they want it all the time. And, you know, right in the palm of their hand as it were. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of compelled you to talk about it? I think again, it's like that, that kind of being the scientist of your own life and your own experience. Like, I think there's a, for men, especially there's this kind of like, this is what is normal. This is what men do. This is what men are. Mm. And I found that for whatever reason, my psyche was just too fragile for that, that kind of influx of, um, imagery. And, and I, I, I never, I, it was almost like I stopped watching it at the doorstep of addiction or compulsivity. Mm. Like it was like, I could feel where it was going. Mm. And it was right around the time I was, I was working with ayahuasca more. Mm. So I think there was a, um, this urge to like cleanse my, not just my body, my psyche. Mm. Like I actually wanted to, because I found when I was a porn watcher, I, it wasn't just the watching, it was um, the images and everything would just stay with me and kind of replay. And it took up a lot of real estate in my brain. And I wanted to free it up for other things. Like I could make a, a a decent moral argument against porn, but it's not that interesting to me. I feel like for me, it was more of a spiritual, um, psychological choice. And I've never, the two th- like getting alcohol and porn out of my life are two things that I never think about. I never miss mm. them. I, and I've had a couple, uh, some people read, you know, this interview I gave where I talked about that and I've had some guys reach out to me who are really hurting around porn mm. addiction. And I know a lot of guys who've really struggled. And, uh, and it's different, you know, it's different when it's on the internet, yeah. <laughs> right? Like we well, both when grew, we up, grew in up in a time. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You know, it was just I'll like. I'll let you do the old person routine. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's back in our day. <laughs> we could just trade off sentences. That's right. Um, no, there was a difference in sort of like how you acquired it, like the methods or, you know, and, and you know, I'm not saying that it was, Okay, I'm saying it was better, better in that it was less available. Yeah. The um, you know, you've talked about um you know, kind of like the variety. I'm gonna there's this quote you have, um, that porn preys upon our vulnerabilities and appeals to the lowest parts of ourselves. And you said it's an extension of what I find to be so exhausting about modern life. We're never not being sold things. Wow. And it's like <laughs> smart guy. It's intense. <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't mean to say like, oh, back in the old days, like <clears throat> naked was just naked, but it kind of was like, and of course there's always been a tremendous like variety and bad things and trafficking and like horribleness. But the, um, I, I, speak a little bit to sort of this, like, you know, this notion of like the lowest parts of ourselves and sort of the way that we can be sold things in the way that we are now, which is different. Yeah. I don't know if I'd phrase it that way. It feels so kind of finger waggy. Mm -hmm. Like I I, I would probably write about it a little bit different now. Um, I think we're doing this like incredibly intense experiment on our psyches Mm -hmm. by flooding um, our brains with this stuff. Like I, you know, there's all sorts of, different ways to, you know, there's like ethical porn and there's like, I, I don't, for me, it's just like, um, I, I, I just, I, I did feel like I, 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 here's what it is. I want to be choosing things. 
I want to be choosing things. I don't want, I know what addiction feels like in my body. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, uh, I've battled various addictions. I've, I've worked programs around various addictions and, um, it's, you know, restoring the freedom of choice Mm -hmm. is like really nice. And I, I, being in the grip of compulsivity, not being able to say no, feeling choiceless is a kind of hell for me. And, um, I, I, I just, I wanted to free myself. Uh, and, and I also, I just had a lot of healing to do around, like I said, like women in relationships and me being a, a porn watcher was not helping any of that, you know? What underlies what you're talking about, which may not be as explicitly stated right now, is that drinking, watching pornography in the way that it is available now changes the, functions of our brain. It changes how we think. It changes the speed at which we think. It changes uh, the way we crave new information or we objectify people in the real world. Like people will think, oh, I'm just doing this over here. I'm just drinking and then I go wake up the next day and I'm not drinking or I'm watching pornography and then I put it away and I go out in the real world. And what we aren't really able to show as effectively is the change that carries with us and that it isn't only about the thing that we're doing over here by ourselves or at a bar. It's how it's impacting us moving forward. And those impacts are significant. You know, when you talk about the idea of choosing, when we start to alter our brain and the way it functions and the way it's looking for novelty and the way it's looking at men or women, and the first thing that we may think or the the images that we are just sitting in the background that we haven't been able to remove start to make us then see a different situation that may not otherwise be sexual as sexual then we that's where the choice starts to be limited we we don't have the freedom of being curious about what might unfold because we're stacking the deck towards this other behavior yeah i i agree with all that i don't know <laughs> like i think that's exactly right you know, we we each have teenagers. Um, and so, you know, this is also something I think about when we think about sort of, you know, it, it's enough to sort of wring our hands over this generation having like they're raised with phones. Look, Josh, the reason the reason I, I rant for a second is because you're extremely eloquent in not passing judgment. And I, I get it. I'm also not trying to pass judgment. I don't necessarily say anything is 100% good or not. You know, there's enormous amounts of sex positivity that happens with adult imagery. However, younger people having access to an unlimited amount, what we're, and, and this goes to gambling also. Yeah. The nature of putting this in our pocket means that we don't have to feel anything totally. because there's always a distraction. And then we aren't able to really do the science experiment because we go so far down the rabbit hole. And you know what many uh, people are sort of warning about it is that we aren't spending enough time in exploration of consciousness, whether that be through medicine or other realms, non, you know, non medicine induced realms or supported realms. And instead, we're just sort of, you know, having an overabundance of this. So anyway, uh, I'll pause there for a second. But I think that was all under what you were saying. And you were being very uh, non judgmental. (laughs) You wanted to get some judgment in there. (laughs) We can do it. Well, just just some caution because I think we're we're not really taking into consideration the big, uh, my my biggest thing is people should know if they're doing the experiment what is leading to what and where we, many people find themselves as being distracted, being upset, not having creativity, not being able to focus, uh, and and many of those things are are caused by other influences that are not directly within their control. However, there are many things that we're being told are normal that have consequences that are not being presented to us. Well, this also speaks to when I try and speak to, I have a 15 and 18 year old. And when I try and speak to them about this, the notion is like every generation, everybody thinks that the kids have got it wrong. And you know, like this is just every, every generation is like, this is just the challenge that you have. And and I I really think they're wrong, Mm. you know? And I wonder like, you know, my parents thought it was nuts that I wanted my own phone. Right. Right. And then it was like, oh, well, we need call waiting. And they were like, why? Why would, you know, 
we needed star 69 so you could sure. know what call you, you know, and like these things were like crazy to them. And my parents were also, you know, my dad was a middle school teacher, so he was interacting with young people. It's not like they were just like sitting in rocking chairs, you know. Right. But I think, you know, for me, everything seems more ratcheted up with, with the internet. Everything seems more ratcheted up with what you have available. And to me, it's just, it's a continuum of distraction. And this kind of speaks to, you know, kind of like the first point that we started with, right? Or like talking about fame, right? These are all the things that in my opinion, I don't mean to be this hippie, like that's what's separating us from a spiritual experience. Meaning I believe state of nature is being in touch with what you access when you're on ayahuasca. Like I really, I believe that there is an extension of that state of nature that we all deserve to live in. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think though, uh, we're, we're being very, manipulated and our consciousness and our attention is being very hijacked by many, many, many things. Yes. And I am under can the I invite grip. invite my kids in so they can hear this? <laughs> I'm under the grip of like, I, you know, these games on my phone, the, oh, the Wordle, the I connections, to, the spelling yes. bee, the crossword. Yes. I love I them. I'm not giving them bee. up because I feel like yeah. they're better for me than porn. You're a very smart guy. You must do very well on those. <laughs> I do okay. I do okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, an addiction to reading about the reading the news, uh, you know, the, yep. the the website that will not we won't mention again. Um, all these things make me choiceless on some level. I mean, I, I can exert some choice, but i'm I'm alert to uh, you know, I love nothing more than having my hooks in a in a good song or when I'm on mm -hmm. fire writing a script or you know, a kind of uh, muse letter or whatever. But I do them fairly infrequently, given how many hours there are in the day, and it's mm. because I my attention is hijacked. And any, it it feels like the hero's journey of our time is reclaiming our attention, mm. reclaiming boredom, reclaiming the ability to just sit quietly with your thoughts, to walk your dog without something in your ears. You know, like I feel bad for the dog. <laughs> like they're really yeah. people don't even pay attention to their yeah. dogs. But but any uh, I <laughs> I've really just had to pay attention to like this is what hooks me and distracts me and right. takes me away from myself, um, and that's you know it's I I really try not to say like porn is bad sure. you shouldn't drink all I can say is I stopped drinking and this is why I don't watch porn and this is why. And then I found that people who are like very sincere and they've sought me out and they've said, I'm struggling with this and I can mm -hmm. point them in some directions that would help them, you know? But I think there's something, I think we're all addicts at this point. I don't think, it, it, it's like we have to really broaden the idea of what addiction is. Um, and I, I think everyone needs some 12-step program I agree or with you. I if agree you don't with have you. an addiction, you're addicted to controlling other people, I promise. Go yeah, to Al-Anon. Go to Al -Anon. <laughs> Yeah, I was just there this morning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it, it is like, um, we're all, we're all like, we're all like worshiping at false altars. So it's like, how can we reclaim some of this? And I don't know, like, it's really hard to be in a kind of free market capitalist society where it's like money, fame, you know, success, like it's, it's kind of everything. And I, I've, I've tasted enough of life and I've tasted enough of that stuff to know that's not, that's not going to get you what you think it's going to get you. I do want to ask about music. Yeah. Um, I'm a, a musical person. I've never heard of somebody picking up a guitar in their 40s. Yeah, and like, I did it. Like you gained proficiency. You also have a beautiful singing voice. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank and you. I mean, I really, really enjoyed um, kind of getting to know some of your, you know, musical life. Um, was this something you like always thought like, I want to learn to play guitar and then you finally did it? No. It's it, very difficult. Yeah, it was like... Um, like your brain is done. Like evolution-wise, you should have been <laughs> dead 15 years ago. Why? Be because like, forgive me, like, you know, we weren't made to live this long. Like learning guitar oh. when you're at that age, like well, I evolution think... is like, did he make, did he, did his sperm do something when he was 20? I... And like, then we don't really need it. I think that there, I think that everyone should learn to do something totally away from where they've been rewarded in their 40s wow. and in their 50s and their 60s. I learned how to go through menopause. Does that count? Congratulations. <laughs> That's an achievement. Um, 
I think that uh, when you're younger, you're always um, trying things and Sorry, failing. Sorry, that wasn't the best joke. I should have been, I learned to live without hormones. Sorry. Okay. Also, maybe not <laughs> the best. Edit that. We'll, Sorry. We'll no, it's fine. But, you know. Um, <laughs> when you're a kid, you're always like trying things and failing at things and something. Mm. But you start figuring out what you get those applause for and what you get, you know, where you're, and you just lean into that. Mm. And I had to get really good at being bad at something. Mm. But I started writing songs with my friend Ben Lee, who's an Australian songwriter. And we wrote an album together. We toured it. I did not play any guitar. Mm. But we wrote all the songs together, music and lyrics. I love that. And then on tour, I started picking up a guitar and I knew a couple chords. And we would tell the sound guy, like, turn my mic almost... <laughs> I mean, turn my guitar almost down to you where you can't hear it. And I would watch Ben and I would I'd pick up his strumming. Like, I was playing guitar in front of paying audiences way faster than I should. It was hilarious. <laughs> And then I, I, I um, started writing my own songs and then I got a guitar teacher on both coasts wherever I was and I would just play every day and songs just started pouring out of me. Amazing. And, um, and now I like make music and tour and put out That's, albums. Is that your, your passion now, would you say? I would say I mean, your like... Wife, your wife is your passion. My wife is my passion. Being newly married. Um, I, I think that there are a few artistic pleasures as great for me as writing a new song and then sharing a new song like it's mm. you know i've been in part of like nine year stories 90 minute stories but like four minute stories are also like incredible if you can if you can really synthesize and crystallize something and get it in a three or four minute song that is just as moving as like a movie or that's incredible like i think it's great yeah i really love it i started acting because of doing musical so i'd always sang so mm. that wasn't new to me right. but i had to my musical theater voice is way different than my singer-songwriter voice. Like, I had to transition into a sloppier... Well, I, I was going to say, I've, you heard, I've heard your singer-songwriter <laughs> yeah. voice. That's not a musical theater voice. No. <laughs> I had to... Actually, Ben really helped me. He's like, you need to lose the drama school. Like, you don't... <laughs> just... You can let things slide out. You know, it's almost like um, being in the theater and transitioning to film and TV. Right. Where it's like, if you're bringing your voice and speech class in here, you're <laughs> you not going to book the law and like order. This. Right. You're not booking that law and order. So... Um, yeah, I, I, and, and learning how to write lyric. I really, honestly, I had this great songwriting apprenticeship with Ben, who I had this equal partnership with, but he would also give me all these tricks along the way. Yes, He's like, tricks. this is easier to do it this way. Or there's he, an app that comes up with rhymes. If you need a rhyme, it oh, lists, I used a rhyme. I didn't know for that. Sure. I didn't yeah, yeah. know about that. Stephen this. Sondheim used a rhyme dictionary, rhyme well, dictionary so you don't, have, he got. you don't have to apologize for that. But he would tell me things like, um, Sometimes my language was too poetic, and he was like, you know, song lyrics are not poetry. Right. Like, he, we have this song called Green Street that I really love on our second album, and he's, we have this line, um, we're keeping on, just keeping on. And he was like, terrible poetry, but you're going to love singing it. Wow. And it's true. It's absolutely true. It's like it's a really great line to sing. So. Who are some of your, sa your favorite musicians? Like, who do you listen to? Or who did you like listening to growing up? Yeah, I mean, there's all the like Pantheon people. I was really obsessed with Joni Mitchell hmm. in college, Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan. And um, I always w wilt at this question, Tom Waits. I mean, I, I really like um, songwriters that have some gravel in their mm -hmm. voice. Yeah. I don't love perfect voices. I like, mm -hmm. I've been listening to like the new Hooray for the Riff Raff is a great, mm -hmm. great album. And, Do you like pop music? Uh, I, I, mean, it's like I don't. Asking someone I, they like I don't actually seek it out, but I have never disliked an Olivia Rodrigo song. Oh, right. You know what I, I mean? mean? It's very like, hard to dislike. Them. She's really great. Yeah. And so, I, are you a Swifty? Uh, uh, somewhat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I would say I. I really. I more. <laughs> am obsessed with her as a cultural phenomenon. Right. Like I'm just like, what is this? Right. Like, like her ability to kind of like change the economy. Yeah, and keep this thing at a full boil all yeah. the time is like astonishing to me and I I were my wife and I worry about her we have well, like same. codependent like yeah. I, is someone check is she okay yeah. does she have an in-house I mean I saw the documentary that's a, I, I like that cool. documentary quite that's a bit great. yeah I like the Billie Eilish documentary oh yeah um and I like her very much like I don't really seek these things out but <clears throat> but when I hear like a good masterfully produced yeah. and constructed pop song I'm like that's incredible do you like counting crows I do I, I go mean, back to our era, so I was just August curious. and everything after I will it's an unbelievable album. I will listen to it probably every six months just yep. straight through my 18 and it's year never old, not amazing correct my 18 year old that's one of those albums that he discovered and like nothing makes me happier than singing 
August and everything out, like with my child, because I that's for me that's one of those that's a perfect album. It's perfect. It's and a it's like perfect album. I got I have a list all in the my way head. through. Correct. I I just read Noah Kahan, who's quite a good songwriter. Do you mm-hmm. know him? He mm-hmm. just sang Long December with Adam Duritz at a oh, festival, wow. and he was like, "These songs are everything to me." Yeah, you know. Um, but I, that's a that's a like Mount Rushmore album. Yeah. For me, Damien Rice's O oh is another album oh, that I'm obsessed with. But um, yeah. Awesome. Um, where can people find out all the things that they should find out? Where can people hear your music? And yeah. where do you like to direct people? My music is available wherever fine music is streamed <laughs> and bought. I just put out an album called Eulogy Volume 1. Uh, volume 2 will be out very soon. Hmm. Um, it's more like B-sides, folky acoustic. Death? Is it about your it's wife? less about death than the first. Al- the first album is really about death. Okay, as you can tell from the title, right? Um, but also death of the old. Sure, it, it's you know death, birth, death. renewal. Yeah, <laughs> some some literal death. Um, that could be your next album. I write these things death. called newsletters, which I haven't written in a while, but I'm switching over to Substack. Oh, okay. So you can find me on Substack and. Um, uh, what else? I don't know. Uh, uh, the Substack is probably the best way to find what I'm up to lately. Um, I've never asked this of someone, but you you use a lot of big, nice words. Can you name five books that have impacted your life? Yeah. I'll just name kind of recent books that have really okay. walloped me. We were just talking about, I don't know if we did it on the air, but Christian Wyman's yes. a bright, uh, the, um, My Bright Abyss. Yes. Astonishing book. Okay. I'm halfway through it. I think it's like, just a masterpiece. I just read this Kala Akbar book called Martyr, mm-hmm. which is excellent. Really a page turner. It's got a great twist in it. It's mm-hmm. really fun and sad and wonderful. Um, I love Richard Rohr very much. He's a Franciscan priest. Do you know him? Uh-uh. He has a book called Falling Upward. Oh. That's the spirituality for the two halves yes. of life. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. For, for aging folk like us, it's uh-huh. an excellent, excellent book. I've kind of like done a deep dive into like midlife self-help yeah. genre like Albert Brooks. I just uh-huh. I, Albert Brooks, Arthur Brooks. I just read from strength to strength. Okay. I'm reading Chip Connolly's book about midlife. Just kind of like again, that that approaching 50 kind yeah. of thing. Um what else? I loved Crossroads, the the Fran the last Jonathan Franzen. Okay. Are you a Franzen uh-huh. person? Yeah. yeah. Um I love um Anne Lamott. Do you know Anne Lamott? Mm-hmm. She is this salty kind of sober character who writes kind of, I would describe them as like spiritual pep talk books. Um, She wrote a book about writing called Bird by Bird that a lot of people read and cite. And she's just like, I'll read anything by her because she's, I don't know, she feels like a, like the salty aunt who's like your best bud who (laughs) like gives you all her wisdom. You know, she's really wonderful. Um, Were you an avid reader as a kid? I was, yeah. I just saw the um, the Outsiders oh. on Broadway, uh-huh. and Essie Hinton was in the audience. I was there opening night. Uh-huh. Did you read those books when you were a kid? No. So there's four of them: right. Rumblefish, and yeah. that was then. This is now a Tex and the Outsiders. And I read and reread those books. So when they oh. introduced her, she was like, you know, just behind us, and I was <laughs> so overwhelmed at like what you know, thirteen year old me would have thought about that. Uh, it's time for rapid fire breakdown style with Josh Radner. What was your mother right about? Take a jacket. You'll be cold. hundred <laughs> percent. It's the most Jewish thing I do is I always have a jacket in case I'm cold. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan always has his whole life in his car in case the whole world collapses. <laughs> what was your father right about? Uh, character doesn't matter in the short term. It matters in the long term. Nice. Location that promotes your best mental health. I do well in like Palm Desert. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. I'm not a... a, a no a, one's ever said desert. I'm not this. a um, beach person. Okay. What's on I'm a lake mountain desert person. Okay. What's wrong with the beach? The sand? I get a little like, like ocean melancholy. Like I look oh. out at it. It feels so deep and big and scary. Okay. So you I like mean, a lake. You want to I like see it. the other no, end. No, I like to, yeah, I need to see the other end. You're also from the Midwest, so I get I'm from, it. <laughs> I'm from a landlocked place, <laughs> so I, the ocean was new to me. Do you have a mantra? 
I mean, I have an actual mantra. Which I know you can't tell me. Okay. <laughs> do you have a uh, Do you have a, a saying? Like that a, you like, like a like an a credo, a yeah. um, something that you live. I by. I feel like I I. I, I, I need to get one. I don't I don't know that I do. Okay. Do you um, use your other mantra? Your I'm I assuming do. it's a transcendental meditation yeah, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. You use still it. use it? I use it <laughs> less frequently. I was a oh, two yeah. I was a twice daily meditator for years. I was wow. really in it. Like twenty minutes twice a day? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah Through yeah. transcendental meditation? Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um I still use it when I meditate. Okay, got it. I did sign up for a Vipassana for a ten day oh, nice. meditation. Um my wife's done a couple of them and uh, she really urged me. Nice. Yeah. Uh, who's been your greatest spiritual teacher? I mean, it sounds like ayahuasca has been your greatest well, spiritual I, teacher. Well, yeah, I'd say that, but also Richard Rohr, this Franciscan mm. who I who I got to know, he really saved me at a time when my, when I was, wasn't, I don't know if my faith was, way, but I was in a very spiritually precarious mm. and, um, uncomfortable and uncertain place and there was something about his writing and his voice and his calm and his benevolence that mm. really um softened me and and welcomed me back into like a theological space that i really didn't want to leave mm. um he's yes. a really important writer to me moment of best intuition i've had a I've had a bunch. I had a really strong intuition about where I should go to college, hmm. to Kenyon College in Ohio, which turned out to be the right school for me. <clears throat> um, marrying my wife. Like, this is, there. there's your wife. Like, that That moment <laughs> was, nice. was the best. Yeah. Who are you most competitive with? I mean, probably like that evil twin inside me. Hmm. And finally, what do you know to be true? It's better to be kind. I mean, that's what, you know, Aldous Huxley, who did every substance and met every teacher and read everything. Mm -hmm. And he was asked on his deathbed, like, what do you, you've done it all. You, you, what do you, what have you learned? And he said, it's, I'm just embarrassed to say, it's just like, try to be a little kinder. Mm -hmm. That's what he got. And I think that's where I'm ending up. It's been really so much fun talking to you. Thanks so we much really for having me. I've been really you. enjoyed this. Yeah. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one And now she's going to break down. 